This is a series of questions for the AQA A-Level Chemistry Inorganic Chemistry topic, Periodicity. The idea behind these questions is that you download them from the description below and test to see whether you've remembered the key facts from the specification. So there isn't any analysis here or any calculations. We're just seeing, have you recalled those key facts? The first thing that you need to be able to do for the periodicity topic is to identify the different blocks within the periodic table. So you should know that the S block contains elements that are found in group one and group two here, whereas the P block contains elements in groups three to zero here. And then the D block is found between groups two and group three. So it contains all of the transition elements, but also zinc and cadmium and mercury. And then finally, down the bottom, we have the lanthanides and the actinides, which are the F block. The S subshells can all contain two electrons, where the P subshells have room for six and the D subshells have room for 10. When we're deciding whether an element should be in the S or the P or the D or the F block, what we're interested in is the outermost, most highly energetic valence electrons. So whatever subshell those electrons are found in, that's going to determine the periodic table block. As we go across period three, the atomic radius actually decreases. In order to understand this, you first need to understand that all of the elements in the same period have the same number of shells. So everything found in period three has three shells. That means that there's going to be the same shielding by those inner electrons compared to the outer electrons. And then as we go from left to right, the nuclear charge is going to increase because the number of protons is increasing. And so this means that there's a stronger electrostatic attraction between the nucleus and those electrons. So as we add each new proton, there's a stronger force and that's going to pull those electrons in closer to the nucleus. As you go left to right across the periodic table, the first ionization energy increases. There are two exceptions to this. The first of these is aluminium. And the reason here is that we're starting a new subshell. So specifically, we're starting the 3P subshell as opposed to the 3S subshell. It's really important that when you're answering a question like this, you actually specify which subshell it is that electrons are now being added to. The 3P subshell is a higher energy subshell compared to the 3S, and therefore it takes less energy to remove the electrons from that subshell. The other exception is sulfur. So in sulfur, for the first time, we're pairing electrons within an orbital. This is the same thing that happens in oxygen in the second period. So the reason that this is significant is that these electrons are all trying to repel each other. And if the electrons are having to share an orbital, then there is stronger repulsion than there is between electrons that have their own orbital. So this means that that next electron is experiencing increased repulsion compared to the other electrons that have been added already, and therefore it requires less energy to remove it from that atom. When you're trying to determine which group a particular element is in, you want to look at the successive ionization energies. So the first ionization energy, and then the second ionization energy, and then the third ionization energy, and you want to compare the size of these. As you keep going along, they're going to keep getting bigger, but at some point you're going to see a significant jump. And this happens when we start removing electrons from a new shell. So say you've been removing electrons from the third shell, each successive ionization energy gets slightly bigger, but then when you run out of electrons in that third shell and you come to remove one from the second shell, that second shell is much closer to the nucleus and it requires a lot more energy to remove that first electron. So if we look at a series of numbers, what we're looking for is where is there suddenly a big jump? And for this set of examples, it's going to be this fourth one here. That is a much bigger jump than from compared to the third one than there is from, say, the third to the second. And so that tells us that that fourth electron is the one that is starting a new shell. So this is in the new shell. And that means that before I got to that new shell, there were three electrons that I could remove from the previous shell. So that tells me that this element is in group three. This is maybe not strictly a fair question because there isn't really one single trend as you go across period three. So if we look at these melting points, they look a bit like this. So what we see is a gradual increase of four elements and then a sharp decrease and then a slightly more gradual decrease. So what we see is that the three metallic elements come first. Then we have silicon, which is a giant covalent substance, and then we get our simple molecular structures. And then finally, we have our monatomic noble gas. 
If we then want to start explaining some of what we're seeing with these melting points, we need to be able to discuss the bonding within these different substances. So as we've already said, the first three elements in period three are all metals, and therefore they form giant metallic structures with metallic bonding. And as you know, that metallic bond is formed from the delocalized electrons being attracted electrostatically to the positive cations. Now, when we think about sodium and we then think about magnesium, you hopefully know that those delocalized electrons are just the valence electrons. And so sodium in group one only contributes half as many electrons to that sea of delocalized electrons as magnesium. And also it has a cation which has a single positive charge, whereas magnesium has a two plus charge. And so both of those factors are going to contribute to the metallic bonding in magnesium being much stronger than the metallic bonding in sodium. And therefore we see a higher melting point because it takes more energy to overcome that strong metallic bonding. Then if we look at phosphorus, phosphorus comes just after silicon. And silicon, as you know, forms a giant covalent structure. It forms a macromolecule with these really strong covalent bonds, which take a huge amount of energy to break. Now, in comparison with that, phosphorus is um, a simple molecular substance. So it does contain covalent bonds, but those covalent bonds don't get broken when it melts. Instead, it's just the weak intermolecular forces which are breaking. So the fact that it's just those weak intermolecular forces, those van der Waals forces that need to be overcome, and they're so much weaker than the covalent bonds, that's going to mean it takes a lot less energy to overcome them and therefore to melt the phosphorus. And then in order to explain the difference between phosphorus and sulfur, we need to think in a little bit more detail about what those molecules actually look like. Molecular phosphorus contains four atoms per molecule, whereas sulfur contains eight. And since we're talking about it, chlorine contains two. Now, these are all uncharged, not polar molecules because they all contain atoms of just one type. So we're not thinking about dipoles here and other kinds of weak intermolecular forces. We're just thinking about van der Waals forces. And because these molecules are all just made of one kind of atom, really the major thing that is going to control the size of those van der Waals forces and the strength of those van der Waals forces is just how big that molecule is. So the fact that sulfur contains twice as many atoms in each molecule means that it's going to experience stronger weak intermolecular forces. And these are going to require more energy to overcome. And therefore, the melting point of sulfur is going to be slightly higher than that of phosphorus. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you found that a useful roundup of the periodicity topic for A-level chemistry. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry resources coming soon.